Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Regan, thank you very much for testifying before us today. Uh, you answered some questions for Congressman Joyce regarding some of California's uh, new regulations and their requests for uh, for uh, waivers with your agency to enforce their rules. I'd like to talk about a different one, which is one that was passed recently uh, by California requiring that all outdoor power equipment be electric by model year 2024. Uh, let me tell you why that's a particular problem for me. I represent a district that ironically for California gets a lot of snow. In fact, my hometown got a little over 11 feet this year, and a lot of people think that that sounds like fun, but I can assure you from personal experience that it was not. Uh, we actually had it better than some of my constituents. Some of my constituents were literally trapped in their homes for several weeks by the amount of snow that uh, we received in the mountains of Southern California. So uh, really the only savior for those residents is that if you live in the mountains, most people have gasoline powered snow blowers. Uh, with those pieces of equipment, even though the county could not plow the roads to get out to them, they were able to plow enough to be able to get out to the grocery store. We resupplied the grocery stores by helicopter, if you can imagine, uh, to try and get uh, medications and foods to those residents that needed it. Um, here's, here's the problem. Uh, I have, there are electric snowblowers that are available. Uh, I have used those electric snowblowers and I assure you that they're adequate for a couple of inches of snow, but not five feet of snow. Uh, they absolutely do not work. And so uh, I'm fearful that this new regulation is going to be completely unworkable for a lot of the people that I represent. So uh, the state of California has applied with your agency for the waiver that will be required to enforce this rule. And I'm wondering if you could tell us what the status of that waiver application is. Um, I don't know the status of that waiver application, uh, but I can tell you I'll prioritize it and we will get back to you. All right. Uh, do you share my concerns with the, uh, the implementability of some of the provisions of that rule? At face value, it sounds very challenging. Okay. Uh, let me put something else on your radar before we leave this topic. Uh, another problem that I have with this proposed rule is that the vast majority of the manufacturers of equipment that's compliant with the rule are foreign manufacturers. And there are hardly any, if any, domestic manufacturers that have equipment that is compliant with the rule. So implementation of the rule will have the effect of shifting the, uh, the provision of this equipment completely to foreign manufacturers at the expense of our domestic industries, which I think would be a very dangerous thing to do. So I appreciate if you could uh, give me an update on that when you know. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit about the EPA's budget request, since that's the, uh, the topic of this hearing. Uh, you have proposed a 19% expansion in the EPA's budget, and I find that a little puzzling given the fact that under the IRA and the IIJA, the EPA has received over a 1,000% increase in total funding. So I'm wondering, with all of this extra money coming into the EPA, why is it necessary to increase to increase the base budget of the EPA by 19%? Well, there, obviously there are some restrictions on the bill dollars and IRA dollars as it relates to being able to hire staff in our enforcement on our enforcement side, which the Inspector General has indicated that that is a must do for us. Um, as we think about approving these new herbicides and pesticides for our agriculture community, uh, we have a deficit of staff there to get those new products on the market. We've got a lot of these products that are tied up in court, like clopyrifos and others. Um, and so the courts have gotten a little bit of a jump on us, and we need to fight those fights, but we need to get new products on the market. And then we have to comply with TSCA, and we have to look at some of these deadly chemicals, asbestos and others, that we need to begin to regulate and rein in. And so uh, many times the IRA and the bill dollars do not correspond with some of the core programs that EPA is required to manage by statute. Okay, you mentioned in that response the Office of the Inspector General within the EPA. Uh, the uh, Inspector General recently testified at a hearing with the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, uh, and when, and in his testimony, he said that the EPA has, is, uh, has a high risk of waste, fraud, and abuse in the EPA's allocation of IIJA and IRA funds. So uh, I found that very concerning. How will you ensure that that waste, fraud, and abuse that the IG is, is concerned about does not occur, occur? 
Yeah, I just met with the IG a couple of weeks ago, and he did not convey that to me, but um, I'll put that on the list of things to chat with him. He's meeting with either myself or my deputy administrator on the execution, implementation, and design of the Inflation Reduction Act bill, our EJ dollars, and the like. Uh, I've tried to develop a very strong relationship with our IG because it's important to me that we maintain our integrity and the responsibility of, you know, shepherding these dollars. And so I'm, I'm interested in the partnership with the IG. Right. Well, I think we're all on the same team with respect to that. I thank you very much for your testimony. I yield back, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Sir.